ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in. In what we can only describe as interesting times, we're grateful for the opportunity to invite virtual audiences together in dialogue, even when we're not exactly, you know, together in space. So I'd especially like to thank Erica and Claire for helping us keep ideas and community aloft here at Town Hall. Tonight's presentation will likely run about 40 minutes, but who's to say at this point, followed by audience Q&A. You can view the event on Crowdcast, Facebook, or YouTube. To participate in Q&A, submit directly using the Ask a Question button on Crowdcast. Keep it succinct so we can get to as many as possible. If you need closed captioning, YouTube is your best bet, and you can enable real-time captions by clicking the CC button in the bottom right corner. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming stuff includes, on Tuesday, Nicole Hannah-Jones with Brenton Mock discussing race in journalism. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal with Naomi Ishisaka offering a blueprint to political action for the next generation of women and people of color. And a special live stream recording of our first podcast residency, Life on the Margins, this week featuring Ijeoma Oluo. Also, make sure to, to visit Town Hall's media library for hundreds of events from both the recent and pre-COVID past, which is frankly also pretty recent. At any rate, Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Civics at Town Hall uh, is supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, first and foremost, and I want to thank all of our members uh, in the audience with us tonight. On that note, quickly, Town Hall, like nonprofits generally, has been hit pretty hard by the economic impacts of the pandemic. Tonight's event is free to maximize access, but we hope you will consider making a donation by clicking on the button at the bottom of Crowdcast or using the URLs on the other platforms or by becoming a member. One final point on the economy, I promise. Let's be honest, if we were all gathered together tonight in the Great Hall, many of you would visit the book signing table. And so we hope you'll use the link on this live stream page to purchase your copy of Erica's book. I should say pre-order that copy of Erica's book directly through our terrific partners at LA Bay Book Company. Local author, local bookshop, big, big launch book of the book night. Uh, keep it local and just maybe some of the things that we loved about this city pre-epidemic pre pre might make it to the other side. All right. Erica C. Barnett is an award-winning political reporter. Beginning her career at the Texas Observer, the venerable progressive magazine co-founded by Molly Ivins, she went on to work as a reporter and news editor for the Austin Chronicle, Seattle Weekly, and The Stranger. She has written for a variety of local and national publications, including the Huffington Post, Seattle Magazine, and Grist, and she was a co-founding editor of the beloved and feisty political blog, uh, blog Publicola. Sorry for the air quotes, Erica. That must have made you cringe. She now covers addiction, housing, poverty, drug policy, and virtually every other matter you can think of. At the C is for Crank, her own blog. And she's a regular guest on KUOW's Friday News Roundup, The Week in Review. Claire Dieter is a Seattle native and the author of two critically acclaimed memoirs and a forthcoming nonfiction book investigating what our relationship to good art made by terrible people. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Paris Review, the Atlantic, and other publications. She's also an educator, having taught at Hugo House, the University of Washington, Pacific, uh, Seattle Pacific University, and other universities across the country. Erica Barnett's first book is called Quitter, a memoir of drinking, relapse, and recovery, and it's the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Claire Dieterer and Erica C. Barnett. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you. Me too. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in and say congratulations. The book is an incredibly impressive achievement. It reads like a house on fire. And um, as a reader, a longtime fan of your work and a sober person, I am so glad this book exists. I'm honored to be here as part of your launch. Hello everyone, this is Josh from Town Hall. We're running into some tech issues right now. Um, we will try and get the show back on track as soon as we can. Just give us one sec. Claire, are you still there? I just re-arrived. Okay, and Erica? I think I'm here. Okay, yep. great. Great. All righty, go ahead. All right. Erica, I'm gonna kick it over to you for a reading. Great. 
Um, thank you, Claire. It's really, uh, it's such an honor that you um, agreed to do this <laughs> um, and that um, you're going to be my interlocutor tonight. Um, I'm such a big fan of yours as well. Um, this is a reading from my first book, uh, Quitter, a Memoir of Drinking, Relapse, and Recovery. Let me tell you what it's like to be sober, really sober, for the first time in years. It feels like seeing color for the first time. It feels like you've been looking at the world through someone else's glasses, and suddenly you can make out every individual blade of grass. It feels like you have a secret superpower that nobody can see, a clarity of mind that allows you to leech insights out of the most banal moments. Your body feels stronger than it's ever been. Food tastes better. Desire returns. At the same time, everything has an intensity that scares you a little. When you feel a feeling, oh my God, how am I ever gonna start paying back my debts? You just have to sit with it, figure it out, wait for it to pass. When you've dampened every experience with the white noise of alcohol for a decade or more, experiencing the world at full blast can be overwhelming. Who do I need to apologize to first? How am I ever going to make time for nine hours of outpatient treatment every week? Do I really have to go to an AA meeting every single day? Why is my boss looking at me like that? Does he think I've been drinking? It had been less than a month since I graduated from Residence 12, sober and hopeful and excited to get back to work. My stay at Res 12 felt like a wake up call, an important pause in a life that had been hurtling forward with no steering and faulty brakes. When I ran through that gauntlet of upraised arms, I felt the way I imagined born again Christians feel when they emerge from the baptismal waters. Not just that my life was new, but that it was finally mine. Almost everyone had high hopes. Mom, who had been so worried when she showed up at Res 12, two weeks into my stay, told me afterward, I'm proud of you. I know you can do this. My coworkers, Melissa and Emily, both also in recovery, initiated me into their secret lunchtime ritual of driving across town to attend a noon meeting once a week. And it felt almost as good as being invited to the secret after party. Friends asked me out for seltzer waters and coffee and sent cards telling me I was brave. When we talk about sobriety or even recovery, the words are often shorthand for not drinking or not using drugs. But the really overwhelming part of staying sober isn't saying no to drinks or learning to avoid the proverbial piece, people, places, and situations that induce temptation. It's figuring out how to live an unfiltered life. That's hard enough when things are going pretty much okay. How many times have you said, I need a drink, when what you really mean is, this day was moderately annoying? <laughs> it can be damn near impossible when there's wreckage stretching out to the horizon in every direction. So to recap, over the past few years of drinking, I had broken my mom's heart, driven away my best friend, alienated all my other friends with my erratic behavior and constant sob stories, nearly lost my job, and accumulated tens of thousands of dollars in medical debt from emergency rooms and detoxes. I was ashamed to show my face at work, overwhelmed by all the amends I felt I needed to make right away, too raw to have a heartfelt conversation with either of my parents, and scared to death that Josh would continue to doubt my commitment to sobriety or that he'd be watching over my shoulder every minute, ready to pounce on any sign that I was slacking off. I had wasted so much time. I had to fix everything right away, but I had absolutely no idea how to start. So I froze. I withdrew to my comfort zone. I worked and went to the gym, lifted weights and worked the phones. And before long, I was too exhausted to keep going to outpatient therapy three nights a week, too exhausted to make it to AA every day, too exhausted to do anything besides trudge from work to gym to home to bed. AA meetings, which I'd attended sporadically for the past seven years, bummed me out. Everybody seemed so relentlessly happy all the time. And I found the three hour intensive outpatient sessions that I had agreed to do as part of my post rehab treatment program repetitive and depressing. A few sad sack losers gathered on couches in a dreary downtown office building, watching VHS videos about relapse prevention and bitching about how much sobriety sucked before blowing into their ignition interlock devices and driving home. Not more than a month went by before I fell back into drinking. Not jumped, fell. The way you fall into bed with an ex-lover because you don't have anything better going on. I can't pinpoint an exact moment when I said, screw it, this is too hard. It was more like an imperceptible slide from not drinking to drinking from militancy to self-pity to indifference to bottoms up. I was a non-drinker, then I was a drinker again, simple as that. I passed the liquor aisle in the grocery store, doubled back, 
and dropped a bottle of Smirnoff in my basket, casually, like a vegetarian tossing a tray of ground beef on top of the granola bars. I wish I had a better story to tell you, one that made sense. Maybe if a close relative had died, or I had lost my job, or been evicted, my relapse would have been justified. Some alcoholics refer to events like this as reservations. If my mom dies, then I'll drink. If my husband leaves me, if I get a terminal illness, but I don't have a good reason or any reason at all. Normal people look at alcoholics who relapse the way I did and wonder, what made you take that first drink? For me, the answer was always nothing in particular. One minute, you're a sober person in recovery. The next, you're telling yourself, everybody else does it. Why can't I? I've learned so much. I'll manage it this time. Maybe you don't even think about it at all. The selective amnesia of the chronic relapser is a force of nature. No matter how many bad things happen or how many times we say never again and mean it, we forget all of it the instant we happen to look up as we walk past the liquor store. Relapse was never a conscious decision. It was more an act of not deciding. If it's true, as many addiction researchers have argued, that people who suffer from addiction arrest emotionally when they first start using substances and have trouble developing higher order cognitive functions like impulse control and the ability to weigh actions and consequences, then I left rehab with the emotional maturity of a 13 year old and the same sense of invulnerability. It's not that I didn't remember what happened the last time I drank or hear the warning I learned to repeat in rehab. Before you take the first drink, play the tape forward. I did. It's just that there was a louder voice in my head saying, you know how to handle it. It'll be different this time. Rehab equips you with mantras. What it can't do is force you to hear them. It was astonishing how quickly the compulsion returned. In my head, the voice of someone at a meeting, alcoholism is cunning, baffling, powerful, and patient. In the morning after buying that first almost celebratory bottle, look at me, I beat this thing. I woke up with my hands shaking and raced for the bathroom to retch into the toilet bowl. Right away, a kind of magical thinking set in. On the way to work, I grabbed another bottle just to get rid of the tremors, I thought. And by three in the afternoon, I was peering over the edge of the same familiar pit. In meetings, old timers say, you don't have to drink, even if you want to. But the fact is, most of us do drink again. Our brains make relapse practically inevitable. Even after physical withdrawal and the fuzzy thinking of early sobriety subsided, my brain wouldn't stop whispering. Wouldn't this be better with a drink? Dependence doesn't just make an alcoholic person's brain less capable of experiencing pleasure or even maintaining equilibrium without a steady supply of spirits. It also creates long lasting pathways between neurons that cause the brain to strongly associate certain mental states, depression, loneliness, excitement, guilt, or experiences with an overwhelming urge to drink. Every time I relapsed and went through withdrawal, those links got stronger and stronger, making it more likely that I would relapse again. We don't talk about the high failure rate of residential treatments. Failure in this case, meaning that people don't stay sober after they leave. But that rate is important, and it's something people should be armed with before they decide to spend tens of thousands of dollars on what may be little more than a 28-day dry out. So here are the numbers. Just four in six alcoholics who enter residential treatment stick it out until the end. And of those, about half will relapse within the first year of leaving treatment. Over four years, 90% of people who go to treatment will start drinking again, although many of them will eventually quit. And yet treatment centers focus almost entirely on relapse prevention while teaching patients almost nothing about what to do about relapse when it occurs. They teach you to halt when you feel like drinking, a mnemonic that stands for hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, four conditions that can precede relapse. And they teach you to practice DREAMS, which stands for diet, rest, exercise, acceptance, meditation, and schedule. They teach you the tools of rational emotive therapy, or RET, which is itself a subset of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. If you're having trouble keeping track of all these acronyms, imagine how hard it is for a fuzz-brained alcoholic in early sobriety. I created a card in my wallet, I carried a card in my wallet for months to keep them all straight. In early sobriety, your brain is still putting itself back together during a process called post-acute withdrawal syndrome, better known by its own cutesy acronym, PAUSE that can last for more than two years. In my first few weeks of sobriety, when I could barely remember to brush my teeth twice a day, I pictured my brain as a soft, pliable sponge full of holes large enough to stick a finger through. I never found out how long it would take me to get through this phase because before I could get there, I went back through the revolving door. Thank you. 
Um, that should give people some idea of the nature of this book, the quality of clarity, honesty, immediacy, and the way that Erica weaves reporting and research in with her own personal story. It's really quite astonishing um, and artfully done. It's, she makes it seem easy and uh, it's not. Um, so thank you. I um, wanted to start by just asking if you could give the people in the audience, since the book is not out yet and will be out on July 7th, and you can buy it from it, pre-order from Elliott Bay. Um, but since the book is not out yet, I was wondering if you could give the audience just sort of an overview or macro, sort of a funny word, idea of your drinking story. Just what that looked like, what the time frame was. Sure. Um, I started drinking um, pretty young. Like I think a lot of uh, a lot of people um, who become heavy drinkers later in life do. Um, but I didn't really drink. Um, much, you know, when I was in college, I was a good kid, quote unquote. Um, I uh, didn't drink in early adulthood. Um, and so the period that I talk about in the book is really a period of about um, about 10 or so years um, from basically my early 30s to my late 30s. Mm -hmm. um, so I was here in Seattle, I was working um, and, you know, you sort of described or where described a lot of the places that I've worked. Um, so that was sort of when I worked at The Stranger, through Publicola. Um, and then, um, of course, I didn't mention this in, in that particular excerpt because um, it was about the first time I went to rehab, but I um, got fired from my job at Publicola and, um, and then got sober shortly after that. So that was about uh, five and a half years ago. So we're, we're talking about a decade of time. Got it. That's, that's um, Okay, that's helpful just to sort of have that out there about what happened. And I think that one of the things that's astonishing about this book, and we talked about this a little bit before, is that it's a so-called ugly drunk story. Um, yes. It's very warts and all, and it's the, the warts are warty. These are, um, these are some tough stories in here. And um, I feel like that's really in contrast with most recovery stories we see from women women's memoirs of alcoholism tend to kind of forefront the whole idea of I'm high functioning, I'm keeping it together, but I'm a drunk. And I can only think of a couple excep exceptions to this rule, notable one being Corin Zalekis, if you've read her, such oh, yeah. a good book. So I guess my questions are to start with, why do you think that is? Why do you think those are the stories that get told and or published? I think um, there's, yeah. yeah. Can I, I, I could, can I jump on that one and then we can go to the awesome. Yeah. I think um, I think there is just such a taboo still about admitting that you are a messy drunk or an ugly drunk or a problematic person or just like a piece of crap. And like, and I thought of myself, I mean, even when I was still drinking, maybe especially then as kind of a dirtbag drunk because mm. I, you know, there was, uh, there was some early um, discussion of the book uh, cover being a glass of wine. And my reaction to that was like, I never drank from a glass. I drank from the bottle. I mean, and that's, that's just the kind of, you know, drinker I am. And as a woman, you know, I think it is, it is very uncomfortable for people to think about women being that way. Although we can think about all kind of examples of men being that way. Right. You know, the guy like on the bus drinking out of a paper bag, um, you know, all the stereotypes. I mean, even like the sort of the ones that we sort of adulate, like Hunter S. Thompson, who is somebody I worshiped when I was a kid. Um, you know, that's, that's also a messy drinker and drug user, but, um, I just, I think women are supposed to be tidy and I think we are supposed to be careful. And I think we're supposed to keep our problems um, secret and small. And, um, and my problem was not small and it certainly by the end was not secret either. I think that one thing that's happening, we'll talk more about this later, but in the dialogue around women and drinking right now is this idea, I'm just going off what you just said, this idea that, um, we need to push against that stereotype of like the wino with the brown paper bag, right? Because alcoholism can look a lot of different ways. It can look like the bottle of wine you drain after putting your kids to bed. And it's really important to tell those stories, but that's not every woman's story. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that's sort of getting represent, represented as the face of female alcoholism, your story, your book pushes against that and says that there's 
you know, this is where addiction can end up and it's scary and raw and real. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, and I think um, I think that it's not just this is where it can end up, but that this is where it can end up for women too. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think there is, you know, a very like upper middle class white aesthetic to mm -hmm. the, you know, the new acceptance of like a certain mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. uh, woman drinker. And you know, this is this is not a book about um, drinking per se, but um, um, uh, Kat Marnell's book was the other one, when you mentioned Corin Zalkis, Kat Marnell wrote a wonderful, wonderful book about being an absolute mess. And not in like a hot, fun way. Like I didn't read her book and think, oh my God, like she, I mean, I did think she's so cool because she is so much cooler than me. But I also was just like, wow, I relate to this. And I haven't related to many addiction memoirs um, because they do tell kind of a, a story that takes an arc and then everything is okay. And my story is like arc after arc after arc after arc. I think this is just an aside that's popping into my head as I think about um, especially good or well-known books about drinking and women, um, including some of you know people like Sarah Heppola or Carolyn Knapp. And one thing that's really unusual about your book is that you stay with it at every step. So what often happens with drinking books is they become- I'm calling it relentless. I'm calling it relentless, yes. In fact, let's jump ahead to the relentless question. Um, <laughs> the book is, you know, not only do you stay with it, you stay with it in scene. You don't sort of start to generalize about what's happening. You take us through moment after moment after moment, which is just from a writing point of view, pretty astonishing. And we'll talk more about the content of the book, but I want to acknowledge the structure and the writing of the book it's completest, it's exhaustive, and as I said here, at times exhausting. And I mean that in a good way. We feel your weariness and your inability to escape. You, we can't escape with you. You hold us in this story in a way that's quite unusual. And can you talk about decisions you made about how to structure the book and especially the length of the book? You know, so it's quite big. Which is, it's funny that you say that because the, the original um, manuscript that I turned in was, I, I don't know what we eventually got to, but I think it's under 100,000 now. I think the manuscript I turned in was like 125, 135. I mean, we cut so much from this book. And I think mm -hmm. it was, I think that was, I mean, I had this amazing editor who just was able to get to the heart of like when I was being repetitive and when I was being a little too relentless and I needed to kind of let the reader take a breath. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to be, you know, very thorough about telling the, the various points when I had what you would consider to be in a traditional narrative, a rock bottom. And, mm -hmm. um, the book kind of starts with one of those and then comes back to it later, but there are many in between and it just, it happens over and over again. Um, because that's what it was like. I mean, it was just like, there's no such thing as a wake up call. Um, you know, maybe there is for some people, but for me, um, it was important to tell that story of like, look, you don't just hit a rock bottom and then get it. There's no, uh, there's no, it's not like, a, there's no cause and effect that you can find in any alcoholic who stays sober. I mean, if you want to um, tell that story after the fact and say, I quit, and therefore the worst thing that happened before I quit was my rock bottom, that's fine, you do you. But I think that um, that is like an ex post facto sort of um, justification or a way of like creating a narrative and explaining to yourself why, um, how you were able to get sober. And for me, this is my ex post facto way of explaining it to myself, which is that I didn't get it until I just did. Yeah, okay, that's really helpful. I think that um, first I want to acknowledge, uh, still on the writing part of it, I want to acknowledge what you said about repetition and I think that this is something really interesting in writing life stories, writing memoir, when you're really getting at honestly lived experience, repetition is kind of both bug and feature, right? Like, I mean, when we make bad decisions, it doesn't matter if you make one bad decision. What matters if you make is if you make bad decisions, you know, as, you know, starting at 14 and going to 44 or whatever it is. Uh, and that to me is what's interesting, but it creates a narrative problem because how do you represent that honestly and yet not, you know, not make it inert for the reader, mm -hmm. which I feel like you really achieved. 
Well, thank you. I tried. (laughs) That's not a useful question. But um, I wanted to, since you brought up rock bottom, I really want to talk about this because it's, it's kind of at the heart of what's going on in this book content wise. You're pushing against certain um, received narratives in uh, drinking stories like rock bottom, um, how the rehabilitation industry works and what it means to relapse. These are all ideas that you're working with. But a lot of what you're dealing with is this idea that um, rock bottom needs to be kind of interrogated. So can you talk a little bit more about that and how you've seen it work for other people as well? Well, I think that when you think of yourself as having hit rock bottom and you think of yourself as, you know, as having learned a lesson from that, it makes it um, really, really impossible to then relapse and feel, um, I mean, not, you know, I'm not saying you should feel okay about relapsing, but I think it makes it really impossible to look at that experience and fit it into that story that you've told yourself about what um, what the alcoholic or the drug addict arc is, right? So if I, you know, got fired from my job um, and evicted from my house, say, um, I would probably think, you know, and, and my husband left me, I don't have a husband, okay, I'm, this, is, this is hypothetical, but like there's all these terrible like milestones that we think of for ourselves. If all that happened and then I got sober and then I relapsed, like what is my problem? Like it, it must be a me problem. It must be something that like I am failing to fit into the story as opposed to the story doesn't fit. Um, and so I think that that actually does damage to people. And I think that um, because relapse is so incredibly common as I was describing in that excerpt I read, um, it, uh, y- you know, it just sets us up for disappointment but it also sets us up for failure because we don't have the tools that we need because we don't think we'll need the tools. We think that we're gonna be the exception that just gets it. And yeah. I thought that, you know, I thought that when I left rehab the first time, I thought, well, I know that like none of these bitches are gonna get it, but I am. And <laughs> and that was just like, could not have been further from the truth. Um, so many questions. <laughs> uh, what's interesting is I just opened the book and was leafing through it while we were having all these technical issues. And I happened to open it to this page, which is really germane to what you just said. Um, you're talking about your friend, our friend Josh. Um, hi, Josh. And you, <laughs> hi, Josh. And you said, he knew something about me that I still wasn't willing to acknowledge about myself. I will turn anything into an intellectual exercise, even my own life. So do you think your intellectualism and your intelligence um, kept you stuck in your loop? you know, thinking you had this figured out? I think that um, that one of the things, one of the characteristics that I've, okay, it's like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna talk about myself, I guess, on that front. Like, <laughs> so I'm trying to deflect a little bit to say that uh, this is kind of a universal truth that I found with people who relapse a lot is like, they over-intellectualize everything. And like, I, and so for me, like I thought, especially, I mean, when I was in treatment, when I was, doing outpatient, when I was doing all these different things, when I was going to therapy, I thought that I could talk myself through it. And I thought that like, if I just fully and thoroughly understand every aspect of this, I can do the things that are required, choose the things that are, I, that according to me are not required because I'm like smarter and better than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and it'll work. And I mean, the funny thing is like the thing that ended up working and uh, you know, was, well, it was a combination of everything I had done up to this point, but the thing, the last thing I tried was AA and, um, and it is, I mean, it's not a dumb system, but it's a system that mm-hmm. literally anybody can just do. And it's kind of like, you just plug yourself in and you decide not to reject things. And, um, I, it could have been something other than AA that that did it, but like I just decided to stop rejecting things and stop, you know, making intellectual arguments for why I didn't need to do things. Well, I feel like that's a theme. You know, that's a theme, obviously, that's touched on at length in the Leslie Jameson book. The recovering is this idea of um, a certain kind of alcoholic who is very, very special. Yes, um, who's preoccupied with their own specialness, and that AA. Um, with its really structured approach, um, pushes your brings you to your own ordinariness. Yes, and I th- and I think one of the things that when I was in treatment, um, 
I got a bunch of my, I got basically my entire medical file after the fact as part of the reporting process, the reporting process for writing this book. And, um, and one of the things that just kept coming up over and over again was intellectualizing, intellectualizing. And, mm. um, and I think that is just like, it, it was almost like they could have just like checked a box because it's so common. Mm. Um, and, um, and so I think it is just, I, I think that intellectualizing, unfortunately, because I love it and I want to do it to everything, you know, I want to construct an argument around everything, but it just doesn't work for sobriety. It just doesn't, I mean, I've never seen anybody get sober by talking themselves out of drinking. <laughs> so is AA um, part of your life now? Um, to, to an extent, um, to a much lesser extent um, than it was at first. I think um, AA is like, you know, it's like a, um, it was really like a lifeboat for me. Yeah. And so, um, so I think as you, or as I, um, got uh, a little more sobriety under my belt and, um, you know, was not as, just didn't need that kind of day to day, like going to a meeting every single day. I mean, that's the thing I did at first, but I will say, I mean, even when I'm not doing things like going to meetings and, um, and just in like working the steps of AA, um, there's just, there's so much of it that I've just integrated into my life, like mm -hmm. just kind of pausing and being grateful and doing all of that cheesy shit that, um, I was told we could swear. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if my parents are watching or something, but um, just all the cheesy stuff that they um, that they tell you to do, um, I've really integrated into my life in a way that's really organic. Um, and um, you know, I just I have a much um, dif just a completely different attitude and outlook on life now than I did, you know, even when I was first getting sober. Um. I'm going to kind of take it down to basics for a second because I don't know how many questions we're going to end up getting. And I feel like there's a couple important things to say. One is there's 150 people listening to this right here. And, you know, if some of those people are maybe, I want to start by suggest, you know, at thinking some of them might be trying to quit drinking or relapsing or considering it. And I guess just on a basic human level, is there anything that you can say to people in early sobriety? I know I clung to any word I could get when I was in very <laughs> earliest sobriety. As, as did I. I mean, I think the thing that helped me was just knowing, I mean, there's, I, of course, like a million AA sayings are coming to me and one is, you know, one day at a time, which yeah. is, you know, I mean, that's one of the things I clung to when I was um, very early in it. Um, the other thing is what I found over time is um, that, things, and this is not universal necessarily for everyone, but my own experience is that things got different very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, they actually got better very fast, but I don't think you can guarantee that your life's gonna get better. It's just gonna get different. And if you just kind of wait a little bit and just say, you know, I'm gonna make it to this point um, and I'm not gonna drink until this point and we'll see what happens. And then mm -hmm. just keep seeing what happens. Um, I think what you will find is that um, in addition to just kind of all the health benefits of not drinking, especially if you were a heavy, heavy drinker like I was, um, just um, your brain will come back. And that is such a gift. And um, for me, like I talked about pause, this, I got, I can't even remember, but post-acute withdrawal <laughs> syndrome. Um, <laughs> it, um, it's totally true. I mean, it took it took my brain a good year to really like mend itself and recuperate to the point that I felt like I was back at baseline. And it is such a gift to feel that happening. And if you if you don't stick with it, you're robbing yourself of that experience. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that's early sobriety. Early sobriety is like getting through those first sixty days and just feeling a little bit better every day. Yeah. And it's, oh man, I mean, I couldn't do it for a long time. And the other thing is, if you relapse, you know, I do think that counting days is pernicious. And I think that it makes a lot of people feel like failures because you feel this, this compulsion to crawl back into, you know, whatever program you're in and say, you know, I messed up. I was at 37 days and I'm at zero. And I think that's a really, um, mm -hmm problematic and sometimes toxic way of thinking about that because you didn't lose that time. You know, you had whatever experiences you had during that time and you learned something from it, whether you realize it now or not. 
um, you absolutely learned from however many days you were able to make it. And then, you know, you can just start over. It's a new day. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to that. Um, while we're talking about things that are pernicious and problematic, can you talk a little bit about some of your thoughts about, um, the, re about the rehab industry? I think you call it the alcoholism industry. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, the treatment industrial complex. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, I went to treatment twice. I went to detox a bunch of times. I went to um, y you know various therapists and um, and I think so. I'll, so I'll confine this, I guess, to rehab specifically because that's what most people think of when they think of treatment. Um, I went to twenty eight day treatment tw twice, and I think ultimately it was good that I went both times. But I'm saying that from the perspective of someone who had health insurance. So my, my debt from that ended up being like less than $10,000, which is a lot. Yeah. But um, it wasn't, you know, ultimately the end of the world. I paid it off. Um, you know, but the thing is, I mean, what they teach you, I mean, just, the, just, just going into treatment. I mean, one of the things that they teach you in every single aspect of it is that you um, don't know how to manage your own life and that you're, you essentially need to be made helpless. Um, they take away your phone. They take away your way to communicate with the outside world. You can't have a computer. You can't bring in, in the case I, the places I was at, you can't bring in any outside like reading materials. And so it's very infantilizing. They, tell, they, they make you do chores and it's like, and what they tell you about that is it's because you don't know how to um, be responsible for anything. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair to tell people that. And I spe especially don't think it's fair to tell women that because women, you know, no matter how screwed up we are or how little we're taking care of, you know, um, our own lives, we tend to feel responsible for other people. And we tend to feel this tremendous weight of guilt and shame when we when we are not able to be there for other people. I mean, even I'm not I don't have kids. Um, and so I can't imagine what that kind of burden feels like when you feel like you're failing. But um, but I uh, I definitely felt like I went into rehab both times just with this amazing uh, weight of shame. And all they did was uh, was compound it by telling me that I didn't know how to do anything. Um, and also I think, you know, if you go to rehab more than twice, like you're you're just giving them money. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, 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 it did uh, in one case definitely save my life in the immediate sense because I was able to detox there. Um, alcohol withdrawal is, uh, can be deadly and um, detox is incredibly important. Um, so that was very important to me, but I don't know that taking you out of the world for 28 days and then just dropping you back in the world mm. is a very effective way and not teaching you anything about what to do when you relapse because I didn't learn any of that um, is I just don't think it's an effective way of dealing with a deadly brain disease. You brought up in your remarks just now the idea of shame that they that the sort of compounding guilt and shame that's created in rehab is something you experienced and um when we were speaking on the phone earlier this week, you mentioned you were talking about the experience of putting what were what you had called an ugly drunk book out in the world. And you said you don't feel shame, though you do feel guilt about your story. And can you talk about shame and putting shame behind you and your relationship to that word, I guess, is what Yeah, I think that um you know, I want to distinguish between guilt and shame because shame is um, is something guilt. Guilt is something you feel on because of other people because you feel an obligation to make things right. And I think guilt is a healthy emotion. I mean, it 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 causes us to behave better and it causes us to make amends to people. Whereas shame is something you do to yourself, and you you know, it's just it's it's all inside your own head, and um, so. By the time I wrote this book, I had, I think, gotten beyond a lot of the shame. So one of the questions that I've heard a lot is, you know, was it really hard to talk about this or that um, episode? And um, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it wasn't as hard as you would think because I had already talked about it so much with my AA sponsor, with others in my life. I had like talked to my parents and, you know, apologized and just started that like process of trying to assuage the guilt. 
And through that, I was able to um, to not feel mm -hmm. shame about a lot of the stuff. And it's funny because like some of this stuff was fairly public and fairly well known locally. Um, probably not to the extent that I thought it was because I just thought like I was going to just be buried in shame for the rest of my life. And um, and it was very terrifying and horrible at the time um, when you know when things would become public about my behavior. But yeah, now I I feel absolutely um, unafraid of talking about the experiences that I went through because first of all, I, you know, I have, I have a disease um, and I do believe that addiction is a type of disease. Um, and second, like I have, I have made my peace and my amends <laughs> with the people that I owe that to, to, you know, to an extent, I mean, it's an ongoing process for your whole life because you're always screwing up, you know, I mean, everybody's always screwing up and having to say, I'm sorry, but, um, yeah, there's nothing, there's no room I can't walk into and talk about what I have done and say, yes, I did that. That was me. And that seems very free. It's, I mean, it's like the biggest gift of sobriety that I can even, I mean, that I can fathom. I mean, if you talk about early sobriety, like get three years, get four years and really start doing some of that internal work that you need to do and you will feel great like because you will just have because shame is the worst emotion i mean it really is like i can be angry and i get over it but shame just you know it gets into your dreams it gets into your relationships with people and it's just it's so toxic and so part of writing this book was was to sort to say like look all this happened like is what happened to you this bad you know, oh, oh no, well, guess what? You can get over it. <laughs> I got over, I got past all this and I didn't have to like leave Seattle. I didn't have to go live in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not buried mm -hmm. in a pit of shame. I mean, people are horrible to me online about my experiences with addiction, even now. And I just think that's very sad and I don't take it personally anymore. And I did it first. Right, right. So um, I'm going to open it up to questions in just a minute here. So I can see we have one question already. And go ahead and go to the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen, everybody, and just type in your question and I'll go through them and ask them on your behalf um, once we gather a few more. Um, going back to that idea, it's really interesting, you know, people weaponizing your, uh, your struggles with addiction against you in this moment, right? Like you do a lot of work that's politically adjacent and seeing people use that against you, it's um, it's just, a, it's too bad, but it's definitely seems more about them than you. My question was um, that I wanted to ask was, do you, you've been doing such incredible work this last month. Um, the reporting, I mean, you're always doing great reporting this week, this month, it's been really visible. And can you talk about what happened, what changed in your work once you stop drinking? I mean, everything changed. <laughs> I, uh, w w immediately when I stopped drinking, I mean, I didn't have a job. And so I had a lot of time um, to just kind of think about what I wanted to do next. And I know this isn't exactly the question you asked me and I will okay. get to that. But, um, but one, one other great gift of having a really, um, a really bad addiction and a really bad addiction experience is that if you can get through it and if you can still get sober, um, it frees you in a way that, um, that I think is totally, it was totally unexpected for me because I had worked this, this job, this essentially the same job from the time I was, you know, 19 years old until I was 37 or whenever it was that, um, that I, I got fired you know, just reporting. That was all I ever wanted to do. It was the most important thing in the world. And like, I was my job and my job was me. And when I lost the job, it was like, I had lost everything. It was like, I, I don't know who I am anymore. Yeah. And um, I have no identity. And um, when I got, so there was that, that when I got past that, I realized I could do absolutely anything I wanted. And, um, and that was this incredibly freeing feeling. And so I started my blog and now it's like a self-sustaining thing that I do full time. And so when I'm picking subjects to cover, it is partly, I mean, it is definitely reader interest. If I was covering something that got no interest at all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be sustainable, but I cover addiction a lot. I cover homelessness a lot. And I cover, um, you know, issues that affect people that, you know, are vulnerable 
and for reasons that may not be immediately perceptible. So particularly yeah. with the with the you know with people experiencing homelessness, I think that people have a lot of theories about what causes homelessness, quote unquote. And um, and I think that you know a, a lot of them are partly right, that a lot of them are stupid. Um, and um, but but for me, you know, when you're talking about people who have really big mental health struggles and struggles with addiction, which is very prevalent among people who are homeless, I feel that it could have been me, um, but for a lot of privilege and a lot of luck. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, another thing that runs through my story is just an insane amount of luck. Like there's a, there's a story I tell in the book about driving down a freeway for you know something like 30 minutes um, in Houston, which is where I'm from, uh, in a complete in a complete blackout. Yeah, like these like 12 lane freeways in a complete blackout, going who knows how fast waking up in a parking lot i was headed to the airport i was on the other side of town and like uh, you know houston just sprawls forever i had no idea where i was and it was the era before smartphones and you know it's like why am i alive i don't know um so I, so when i look at somebody who's who's living in a tent and is addicted to say alcohol or heroin i just think if i didn't if i hadn't been lucky and if i hadn't had like a certain number of privileges like that absolutely could be me. And and so I feel an empathy for homeless people that I think, I think a lot of reporters feel empathy for homeless people, but I think I feel it in a different way because I truly feel like I could have been there in, in that tent. Yeah, sobriety has really changed my empathy level for sure in a way that's not sort of, you know, about how great I am. It's just, it just happens to me because I have that experience of imagining myself in the other person's positions so much more. I'm going to move on to some audience questions. Uh, Peggy asked sort of the opposite of what my question was. How do you feel like your writing was affected by your drinking when you were drinking? Maybe what was it that you were held back from? Or I think I, um, well, first of all, th this is something I talk about in another chapter about, you know, writing a column and, um, and you know, and thinking it's like the greatest thing in the world, you know, sitting like knocking back a few whiskeys or whatever. And, um, and then waking up in the morning and looking at it and just thinking this makes no sense, you know, or like, or this isn't, this isn't accurate. And so there's just that sort of very base level of, you know, it's, it's just not, it's not as, it's not as good of writing and it's not great journalism to be drunk. I mean, you just, you can't write as well. Um, and I think, um, how else was it affected? I mean, I think I, I think I really limited my ambitions. I think the idea of writing a book would have been impossible, just absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. I thought I told myself a story about myself, which is that I can't really write more than 500 words because I don't have that kind of attention span or I'm not literary or I, you know, just don't have these capabilities. I'm not smart enough. I just don't have the focus. And there were so many stories that were partly true. I didn't have the focus, but I also had the capability inside me somewhere. I just just thought like, I'm such a piece of crap that there's no one wants to read, you know, anything more than pithy little items for me. And, and I really believed that. It's interesting because you do come from an industry that's soaked in alcohol. Yeah. Um, so do you think that a lot of journalists maybe are operating with some of that feeling? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, and I've never I've never asked that question of another journalist because I mean that would be that would be, you know, a little invasive, but um but I, it wouldn't surprise me because I think like I think a lot of journalists I mean I do know that you know, you just you tell stories about yourself based on what industry you're in and what you've done. And I also think, you know, if you are somebody who's kind of barely hanging on because you're drinking every night, because you're hungover in the morning, because you're like just trying to get the facts straight in your story and make it make sense, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to be thinking of more ambitious things necessarily. I mean, I know, and you know, maybe this is a gender breakdown thing too. Like I'm speaking as a woman, like maybe guys are like, I am going to write the next great American novel. Um, I think that, Perhaps that happens among people who just kind of think of themselves differently. But I can, yeah, I can totally see that um, just because that was so much my experience of just feeling like I, I'm not good at this. Like I'm lucky that I'm here and that these people are fooled into thinking that I know what I'm doing. You know, that's what I believed. 
I do know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna... Everybody has imposter syndrome, but it was, it was, it was something else. Hmm. I'm going to jump to the next quest audience question from Lizbeth. Uh, question after my own heart. What are some tools you use to get over the regret over the time you lost when you were drinking? Um, I don't feel that I lost the time because I, you know, this is this is perhaps putting a, a, a positive spin on what that what those years were like. I mean, they were terrible. But the fact is that I wouldn't be where I am now um, with if had it not gone that way. And so I don't have any way of knowing what it would have been like um, had I not lost those 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I find that regret like shame is a very toxic emotion. And uh, it's it's but it's harder to expunge in a way because it is true. Like you look back at that time and you just think, oh, my God, like I could have done this, this, this and this, you know, um, an example I've heard and this comports with my own age, although I never wanted to have kids is like I could have had kids, you know, or people who've lost their kids and didn't get that time with them growing right. up. I mean, I think you have to, um, the, the best way to get through that regret is the same way that you get through shame with addiction. And I think it's talking about it and it's finding out how, if, if, there's, a, if there's a way to make amends to the people that you've hurt. And that doesn't mean just like apologizing. It means saying like, is there anything I can do now that would be helpful to you? and not dictating like what it is that you think you should do for them, but just asking. And, um, and for me, that, that helps expunge the regret. And, and I also, I just have this really strong belief that you are who you are because of everything you've been through. And so I don't know what I would have been like, but I do know that I probably would have spent a lot longer thinking that I was my job and just telling myself stories about myself that weren't true as it turned out. Mm. I mean, like, for example, I, you know, I, I lost my job, as I mentioned, and, um, and I thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen to me, but it actually was one of the best things that ever happened to me, which is like crazy to hear coming out of my mouth now, given the way I felt when it happened. I mean, I was like, just uh, crushed. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it also just takes time and perspective. It's interesting that the answer to both, you know, these two really um, sticky emotions, uh, sh I don't know if they're emotions, whatever, shame and regret, that your answer to both is the same, which has to do with amends, um, which takes the emphasis off the self too. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that a lot, of, um, a lot of recovery and just a lot of recovery work and recovery talk is about taking emphasis off yourself yes. and figuring out what you can do for other people which is honestly like a great way to recover from all kinds of things, not just addiction. Yeah, I think it's a big theme right now for all of us to think yeah. about. Um, really interesting to think about amends in that context. Um, we've been, do you feel like taking one more question is yep. about right? Okay, let's do that. Um, oh, there's a couple more on here. Why don't we take, try to take two more and then wrap sure. it up? Okay, uh, the first one is another great question from Jean. What are your thoughts about the alcohol industry's influence on drinking in our culture and the lack of regulatory limits or public health outreach on alcohol-related issues? That is a great question. I think that part of uh, the reason we don't talk about relapse and the reason we don't talk about alcohol addiction is because the industry is, is just pernicious in every single you know, aspect yes. of life. Right. I mean, like I have a pile of magazines over here. Every, you know, every one is just full of liquor ads and, you know, recipes for drinks and things like that. Uh, there's billboards everywhere. You walk into the grocery store and they're just like screaming in your face. Um, and I, I think it is I, I would policy wise like to see um, both more regulation on alcohol advertisements and higher taxes on alcohol, because it does, um, in fact, reduce the amount that people drink. Um, and I, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to get to a point where we think of, I mean, it's funny because we have like these drugs that we make completely illegal, like heroin, which I don't think should be illegal. And we have drugs that we make extra, extra legal, like you're really supposed to be consuming them. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you, right. um, like alcohol. And it used to be cigarettes as well. And I think that we can make a cultural shift 
I, I mean, it is possible, but we're not headed in that direction right now, especially in quarantine, where you know the message is just like have happy hour with your friends. It's four o'clock somewhere. Um, you know, it, it's eleven o'clock in the morning somewhere. It people just, I think, feel and and I have picked up on this myself, even as a sober person. This tremendous pressure to um, to turn to drinking as this is the one way you can have fun at least while you're stuck inside. I, yeah, I did want to bring that up. I think that you had mentioned earlier this idea of um, reservations, mm -hmm. right? Like people having certain reasons that they get to relapse. And I feel like in this moment in COVID that there's constantly people coming up with justified relapse. You know, we're sort of surrounded with people talking, all, social media all the time talking about how people need to be drinking. And um can you, I mean, do, can you talk a little bit about how people use, how we use situations to, ju to justify our drinking? Well, I mean, I certainly did um, when I was drinking. I mean, especially when I was still drinking publicly, most of my drinking was, um, was pretty shameful in private. But, um, but I do think that there is a sense in which, you know, I was reading like an advice column the other day and it, um, and I, I did a tweet about this. Um, it was the, co the, the lead question was, um, somebody is having a dry wedding, how do I deal? And the answer was bring a flask. And it's just, it's so everywhere. It's just everywhere. And, um, and I, I, you know, I wish I could make it stop and just let people make their own choices about things because right. the fact is the only reason that we think that drinking is the way to get through things and cope with things, you know, instead of, I don't know, running or or another substance, you know, weed, whatever, uh, you know, is because it's just constantly pushed on us all the exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah, it connects right back to Jean's question, right? That you think that you're, you know, this idea that you're freely drinking, that it's your own choice. Of course you are, those are choices you're making, but there's this, you know, trillion dollar industry making sure that you're doing that and that you are, you know, subject to a capitalist force when yeah, you're never choosing choose, to drink. We never choose our choices in a capitalist system. We just don't. Exactly. It's not it's not possible. Like you think you have free will all you want, but there's there is still this like anvil of capitalism uh, over your head at all times that And nowhere more than with your evening glass of wine. Yeah. Um all right, well, we will move on from there. And just one more question from Deanne. And this, you can do with this question what you'd like, because it's very open-ended. Deanne just jumped in. And how long have you been clean? Did you use other drugs? How long have you been writing? So go where you'd like with that. Sure. I, and that'll be our last question. I stopped. I was not um, oh, using I just other... lost you. Can... Am I here? Uh, this is Josh. I can still hear you, Erica. So if you want to just keep going okay. with your answer and hopefully we can have Claire reconnect, but go right ahead. Great. Okay. Josh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, Claire. I can okay, hear I you. You're both, you're both still coming through fine, <laughs> but Erica's just going to go ahead and respond. Okay. So um, while we wait for Claire to reconnect, I, um, I started drinking when I was about 13. Um, and then I, and I, I did a lot of other drugs then, you know, um, it was the nineties. I was in high school. I did a lot of acid. I smoked weed, you know, I mean, pretty, pretty minor stuff, um, in the scale of things. And then I didn't really drink, um, until I was in my, um, heavily until I was in my thirties and I have been, um, and I didn't really do a lot of other drugs either. And I mean, drinking was really my my main squeeze once I uh, once I really started. And I've been sober for uh, five and a half years. Um, my sobriety date is February fourth, two thousand fifteen. Um, and I have been writing basically since uh, forever. I started writing when I was uh, I started writing professionally when I was about um, eighteen, nineteen in college. I started taking internships. Um, back in the days when uh, internships were a thing that you did not get technically paid for. Um, and uh, and I've just been doing it ever since. I, As the intro said, I started um, as an intern at the Texas Observer, started writing there, and then have been like in alt weeklies um, ever since. Um, and then in 2009, went out completely on uh, the on online platforms. And um, yeah, so gosh, how many years has that been? Um, more than more than 20. 
Claire, do we have you back? Kind of. I'm okay. dipping in and out. I'm going to step aside and let you two close this out because I'm dipping out. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Erica, any final words? Just thank you so much for uh, for hosting this. And I'm really glad we were able to get uh, past our technical difficulties, sort of. <laughs> and um, thanks for everybody uh, who is tuning in on YouTube and Crowdcast and Facebook. All right. And again, thank you, everybody. Um, our apologies for starting late. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, thank you again for tuning in this evening. And really big thanks to Erica and Claire for being here. Uh, if you enjoyed this event, you can find many more just like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. And we hope you'll consider making a donation to Town Hall as your support will allow us to continue having events just like this one. If you're interested in pre-ordering a copy of Erica's book, Quitter, a memoir, Memoir of Drinking, Relapse, and Recovery, which will be out July 7th. You can use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. And finally, thank you again for being here. We hope you have a great evening. Oops.